Amen. Well, it's Christmas season. Can you believe it? Yes. The wind's whipping down the boardwalk. Mr. Springsteen says, uh, "It's that time of year." Uh, we, we're not going to bring me a new sack. <laughs> yeah, we, we might need some new instruments. Uh, you know, we all have our favorite uh, Christmas songs, uh, cookies or uh, foods, you know, our traditions, and specials. Um, you know, uh, I love the, the, the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Yeah, as if he were like a celebrity like Mariah Carey or something. He had his own Christmas special. Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah and, and, and of course, the soundtrack's awesome. Vince Coraldi's jazz trio, you know, yeah. and... Uh, and this mass hit, Linus and Lucy. Yeah, that's the that song, the piano, just, it's all piano. I mean, nobody knows the name of it, but it's actually a name, not Linus and Lucy. Yeah. I heard it yesterday. And this story starts, uh, well, it's, it's Christmas season, it, and Charlie Brown can't get in the spirit, you know. He's feeling kind of down, and, and he, he, you know, it's very incongruent, you know. It's, it's supposed to be a time that's festive and joyous. It's a festival, right? It's a celebration. And, and so he goes to see the, uh, his therapist, and who's his therapist? Lucy. Lucy. <laughs> what a, you know, from, from the frying pan into the fire, right? You know. But but it's funny because she draws out of him that he's depressed, and and of course he isolates. But you know because the other kids are abusive toward him, right? So you know you can't blame him, can you? You know. So she prescribes involvement uh, through participation in the in the school Christmas play, and of course he ends up as. The director. It's a, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, in this session, you know, uh, he processes this struggle of uh, not feeling, you know, like extremely joyful, you know, just because we turned the calendar page, and and so there there's something in that which resonates with many of us at this rolling time of the year, as the ghost of Jacob Marley told Scrooge, or you know, called it, you know, so. We we, uh, we we all tend to see the struggle with it. It, it, it. Christmas sneaks up on us, you know, as we make our Thanksgiving plans, and and, and in the stores and the television, you know, there's two experiences that are uh, decreasing, you know, gradually, you know, for, for our society. You think about that, you know. But but they 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 promote the mass participation, uh, you know, in in in, uh, in in Christmas motivated spending and. As early as October, you know, how do you, you know, think about these commercials. How do you surprise some, you know, your spouse with a new car? Yeah. I mean, you get about that? I mean, like, a big ribbon. First off, <laughs> yeah, and they drive through the snow and they don't get dirty at all. You know, how does that happen, right? <laughs> Computer graphics, I guess. Yeah. So, I mean, hey, you just have a spouse, it means they, don't, they didn't have anything to do with it. So, the car is in your spouse's name. So, it's really their car, not yours. And you didn't get to choose the make or the model, let alone the color. So, I mean, what's up with that? <laughs> what if they get in it and just drive away? <laughs> but, yeah. but here it is, Merry Christmas, you know. And, you know. If you think about it, if you can afford a new car, would it not be a point of discussion? You know what I mean? Like, you know, what kind of car are we going to get, you know, and all that, right? So, but one spouse just usurps all of the, uh, the independent decision making, you know. Oh, yeah, and, and, uh, so anyhow, <laughs> yeah, I think about the uh, See you later, buddy. our protagonist, Charlie Brown. He's never Charlie. I don't know why, but he has to be Charlie Brown. You know what I mean? Chuck. We're familiar with him. He does get called Chuck at some point, doesn't he? In the, in the uh, third sequel, maybe. <laughs> yeah, the problem is he's looking for joy and fulfillment in the trappings and traditions, but they've lost their meaning to him. And so do they tend to with us. Because we just, we forget. Yeah, you know, I, I shared this with one woman one time in church. She said, take focus factor. I said, it's, it's a spiritual amnesia. We forget everything. We forget our dependence on God. We forget the cross. We forget the word. And we need to be reminded. We need, we need spiritual focus factor. That's why we get together. That's why we look at the Word together. We need to be in the Word and be reminded of it as we are today. So often, we are, too, like Charlie Brown, prone to go through the motions, going right into the season, getting up the decorations, starting with a tree, the lights, oh, yeah, the lights, <laughs> and the presents. And that gets really dicey, especially when there's children. 
and the tree and the presents are expensive, and, 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 the, and the tree and the lights take a lot of time. And, and, and then there's your own wish list. <laughs> now, we all got ours, right? And, you know, and, and hosting. Hosting takes a lot of time and work. You need to think about cleaning the house, right? We, we used to host, and, and, and it'd be, the biggest work would be me cleaning up all my mess. Yes. <laughs> it would take hours. You know, and, and uh, you know, in our, and, and, if, and if you're cooking, even more, right? Oh, my goodness. You know, in, in uh, our 20s, idealism hinders realistic expectations of who we're able to visit and, and how much we're able to do and how much we're able to spend and how much time we have to do it all in. Online shopping aids the time element, but we might end up more easily going over budget because uh -oh. of it and visiting so many stores on the internet. You know, we, and we come away disappointed, exhausted, and worse, in credit card debt, <coughs> and frustrated. <laughs> year after year, we may repeat the same mistakes, and we become like Ebenezer Scrooge. We turn into the, to the Grinch with his backstory, right, of abuse too, and his hurts, which we're more reminded of seemingly for some reason at Christmas time. Maybe because it's the end of our calendar year and we measure our lives naturally, thereby take stock or inventory of where we are in life. Another year older, <laughs> John Lennon sings, but that's a good thing. You know, as we looked at last month, we all need to take inventory of our lives, not only those in substance addiction recovery. Lamentations 3.40 says that. Matthew 7.5, the Lord said, get rid of the log in your own eye. 1 Corinthians 11.31, let us examine ourselves, each one of us. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 9, of which um, Vine writes, uh, the experiences of sorrow prepare for and enlarge our capacity for joy. It's at year's end we become more keenly aware of the disappointments of our lives and losses and hurts which we've sustained yet have failed to fully grieve and, and process our way through in relationship. Aha! There's an even more sore spot perhaps, right? Yeah. An area that shows up glaring in the Christmas tree lights, relationships, or lack thereof, we find ourselves so often underconnected. Like some Hallmark Channel Christmas movie. You know, how many people stay in relationship with someone who, with whom it's not working out, and they have settled, and they don't want to settle any longer, the other person with the other person's character deficiencies or incompatibility and uh, they uh, they will stay in the relationship anyhow until the holidays are over because they don't want to be without or not in a relationship you know to, for the holidays you know and then the dating sites fall fill up right after New Year's Eve's over you see the Nissan commercial, the parodies, the Hallmark Christmas movie, the, it tells the entire formulaic story in, in 30 seconds. Have you seen that? It's pretty clever. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hilarious. Really. And, and then I see they have a 15 second version for those of us like me where you've got a shorter attention span. You know, like, oh, the movie's too long. <laughs> the 30 second version's too long. And why do movies are so long, right? Anyhow, right? You know? You know, and don't you wish they would do that with movies, give you the shorter version if you'd rather see that, right? You know, half the length instead of three hours, an hour and a half, isn't that just right? You know, instead, they give you the editor's cut and they add the scenes back that weren't deemed good enough and they make it four hours long. You know? Crazy. Yeah, I think that uh, we all do well to learn it's okay to not feel okay at times. And, and that God has a purpose for our suffering, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's our repentance and conforming to Christ's character, Romans 8, 28, 29. And similarly, we do well then to identify some resolutions that you're into as we become aware of these things. 
to getting uh, to make uh, do some work uh, to feel joyful again, which might include uh, grief therapy or, or grief group. Uh, there, there's lots of uh, churches that offer these. Uh, I've facilitated uh, grief share groups with people who have come more than more than uh, more than a few times. You know, through putting time in over years, uh, still struggling to to express their grief and sorrow and um, heal together in community in relationship. You know, there's even a Christmas grief share group some churches offer, or celebrate recovery for which habits, hurts, and or issues that uh, you can get help from the group to gather with others, one another, as the epistles call it. Uh, we talked about the 12 steps, which are based on the scriptures last month, and, and the first word of each step is we. Uh, one, I think one another, as the epistles call it, or another one, right? Even meeting one-on-one -on -one with people. You know, if, if we're... If we allow ourselves to feel and express the sadness, that's our path to healing and, and gladness. Through the connection, that processing, our hurts and relationship brings to us this purpose of getting close to somebody else which we're created and redeemed for, to be connected to. You know, and that's where we get, that's where we struggle with. You know, in fact, relationship is, is what the first Christmas is all about. Let me show you how. We often call it really uh, that it's about salvation. But the biblical doctrine of salvation, or doctrines, correctly, you know, is it, it, as Charles Wesley wrote, God and sinners reconciled, 2 Corinthians 5, by the cross. Right? So the first Christmas is about reconciliation or salvation and salvation has to do with a relationship uh, starting with God and then you can't get what you don't got but if you get it you can give it out to others but you, between but start, start sharing the gospel to others uh, you know uh, to uh, sharing support with others Galatians 6 if we share it we can bear, bear one another's burdens right and so Charlie Brown's special climax is Linus sharing the gospel with Charlie Brown and all who are there at the rehearsal. And then let us take a brief look at two other examples from Scripture. The second chapter of Luke. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous. That is, mostly uh, you know, by faith in, a, in, a, in the coming Messiah, Romans 5. And devout, that is, he was devoted to Yahweh and the uh, coming Savior that was promised. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Messiah. Isn't that interesting? That is really something. You know, a lot of people say, you know, I, I, I have to hold on, you know, uh, I have to hold on, you know, to, you know, uh, and, and then... They, people that never thought it would happen. The Eagles won the Super Bowl. And, I, and uh, people in my father's generation were saying, now I can die in peace. Yes. <laughs> but this is something better. <laughs> Even better than the Eagles winning the Super Bowl. Wow. The coming of Messiah. You know, as, you know, as required, uh, Exodus 13, on the 33rd day after the Lord's circumcision, which was on his eighth day, as required by Leviticus 12, Jesus was presented and dedicated in the temple uh, through the sovereignty of Yahweh. Uh, you know, Jesus, even as an infant, is in complete compliance with the Old Testament law. He is fulfilling the law as a newborn. Don't you love that? Yes. <laughs> and, of course, uh, he continued through for 30 years. Simeon is led by the Holy Spirit into the temple courts. And then, right on cue, uh, stage, enter stage right, you know, uh, guess who walks in? Or more accurately, is carried in. Jesus. <laughs> by his parents. Uh, verse 28, Simeon took him in, in his arms. Uh, yeah. What a moment. 
Can you imagine being Simeon? How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and his pleasure and joy he brings. Yes. Yeah. But this is no ordinary baby. <laughs> this is the, the consolation of Israel. The Son of God, the Savior of the world, has come in time, in due time, at just the right time, in God's time. Yes. And so me praise verse 29. Now you may dismiss your servant in peace. <laughs> he tells God, uh, it's okay now. Yeah, he actually was told this anyhow, right? He's just, he's just touching base with the word of God. <laughs> For my eyes have seen your salvation. Yes. The Savior of the world who would reconcile the world to God by his death and resurrection and endless life, as Wesley wrote. <laughs> Uh, or whoever it was. <laughs> Verse 36 tells us of a prophetess, Anna. We have an Anna. Yeah. Uh, she's into the word, too. <laughs> How about that? Uh, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and into salvation. And, and, and this Anna, the, the daughter of Penuel, of, of the tribe of Asher, you know, the tribe of covered parcels, Boscoff cells, you know, uh, and she widowed after her seven-year marriage and never remarried, and now is 84 years old. You know, it's funny, as a new believer, you know, I would study past, I would be reading passages like this. And then think, wow, man, you know, I just don't have time to do this. all the study of the backstory of Anna, you know, for Simeon, you know, all the know, all there is to know about them. Really, you know, all the reading I've got to do, you know. I, I wish I, I'm curious, though, you know, and I wish I had time, you know. But you know it's funny because so many, so often in, in cases like this, uh, you know, uh, what what else does the scripture tell us about Simeon and Anna? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, as as my uh, as my former mentor, one of them, uh, Pastor uh, Paul McCardle of uh, Old Nations Baptist Church in Queens, New York City, uh, who I met through Gordon. And, and he would say, well, Fred, God has only told us in his word what we need to know. <laughs> because all about them isn't what was important. Yeah. Their role at this very specific time in history was what was important. was to identify the Savior who had been born. <laughs> yes. You know, back to Anna. <laughs> Married seven years, widowed, and never remarried, now 84. You know, I always wonder why someone never remarries, you know, and goes the rest of their life. You know, you know, I think about, they say, uh, no thank you, I don't want seconds. <laughs> Enough of that. <laughs> you know, 1 Corinthians 7, eight, it's good for you to stay unmarried. You know, like a, verse 9, unless they cannot control themselves. Uh, that's the man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, unless, it's, it's just a, unless they cannot manage themselves, you know, we need a keeper, <laughs> a manager. Uh, it's Ruth. <laughs> You know, we're lost without it, you know. God gave us a helper, you know, because, like, she's the whole thing, you know. I had a friend who said, hey, you meet my better half. Uh, correction, better three quarters. <laughs> you know, the whole thing. <laughs> you know? uh, so, so maybe that's the answer to why Simeon and Anna never got together. Do you think about that? <laughs> you know? I mean, they're, they're, they're both available. They're both hanging out at temple every day, waiting, you know, for how long, you know? <laughs> then, yeah, the Hallmark thing doesn't happen, you know? You know and maybe had a, Anna had enough of him getting enough, you know? I don't know. But of course, she had enough from her first marriage, you know? That seven years was just like, like Scrooge said, seven years this uh, Christmas, seven Christmas Eves ago, you know? And you've labored on it ever since, you know? You know and, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, she realized maybe, you know, I mean, uh, she knew about Simeon's prophecy. As soon as the Lord came, Simeon's going to drop dead. <laughs> you got, he's got an expiration date, you know. I mean, we all do, but uh, they knew kind of exactly when it was coming, and they were looking for it coming every day, right? So there's that, right? No doubt. So, you know, <laughs> you know she, she identifies the... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and Simeon holds that baby and says, "Now you may dismiss me." <laughs> it doesn't tell us how long he lasted, you know, but like NFL, I think not for long. <laughs> you know, uh, 
You know, so she, she identifies the Messiah and gives thanks to God, too. I love that. It's, a woman gets equal share. Isn't that cool? In fact, we're told more about Anna than we are about Simeon. Pretty cool. Yeah. And she doesn't die. <laughs> she, she's got things to do and people to see. Verse 38, she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to redemption. I've seen the Savior. He has been born. He is here. The, prom the one promised, chosen by God to suffer. And he will crush the head of the serpent from the beginning. And he has come. She's spreading the good news and gives thanks to God. Thanks and praise. Hallmarks of spiritual health and well-being. you like what I did there? Yeah. And we go to the top of uh, Hebrews 12, uh, 5a. For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the what? The cross. The cross and it's saying that for the joy on the other side, that is specifically the joy of the Father. And his pleasure expressed through the exaltation of the Son. To be, in our experience of eternity, though God is without time, <laughs> at the Father's right hand, with all authority given to him by the Father. The first chapter in Hebrews quotes the 45th Psalm as referring to the Son. God has anointed you, pouring out the oil of joy on you more than anyone else. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> Not because of trappings, but because of their meaning. Uh, because He brought salvation in, in submission to the will of the Father, to obedience, even to death on a cross. Similarly, you know, for us to surrender to the Father's will is to be filled with the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, or under His influence, Ephesians 5.18. And then the Spirit, in that sanctification process, will produce characteristics of Christ's life, God's goal for suffering, which were created and redeemed for. Now the first is agape. God is agape. First John 4. Yeah, that is his nature. <laughs> Out of which uh, Christ dies for sinners. Romans 5.8. Right? What's the second one on the list? Joy. Joy. Whoa. <laughs> How about that? Joy. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's funny because uh, the Lord is called the man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief, Isaiah 53, right? He came to die. Right? And yet for the joy set before him, that's why he did. The joy of the Father's pleasure. So can we appropriate that as our purpose in life also? And have the joy that comes not from moments or only, or celebrations only, or circumstances only. Uh, lastly, <laughs> example, uh, which ties into this. I don't know if anybody remembers I shared this uh, year. My favorite, uh, my favorite person in Scripture after the Lord. <laughs> uh, uh, little guy, unimpressive in person, used to have an anger problem. <laughs> Who's that? Paul. <laughs> yeah, I got that file of that. <laughs> and his letter to the to the church at Philippi, which we studied this year um, earlier, the uh, epistle of joy. How about that, right? <laughs> yeah. Despite Paul's circumstances, he's imprisoned in Rome, just as he was imprisoned in Philippi, and sang hymns of praise while incarcerated for preaching Jesus. You know, uh, these are his circumstances. And he writes about joy. <laughs> Out of Paul's suffering, the Philippian church is born, 
and out of Paul's Roman imprisonment, the epistle of joy is inspired. For chapter, for verse, rejoice uh, in the Lord. The verb form. Whoa. Now, the verb is an action word. What does that mean? That is something that you do. <laughs> That's a part God gives us. It's my responsibility. That's your responsibility to rejoice. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I deal with uh, residents in a long-term sober living program, in addiction recovery, and it's really not that any different from any of us. We have to learn to do the will of God, not the will of me. <laughs> so that means we don't go by what we feel. We don't do what we feel like doing. Uh, the residents used to feel like getting high, so they get high. <laughs> So, so now they, they go everything from being kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. I don't always feel like doing those things. I wake up in the morning and I don't know what planet I'm on, what century I'm on, I mean, you know, what time zone, what millennium are we in? Sometimes I forget. I say 19 something. Yeah. I don't wake up. I got to get resurrected. <laughs> so the, the people I see on the way in, you know, my brain struggles for two hours to process all these things, you know. And, and people I know well, I, I can't even come up with their name. Uh, I do pretty good with Ruth. You know, <laughs> and, and her mom that lives with us is mom. So, yeah. And I, get, I see the residents, and I call them by the wrong name, and they get highly offended. You know. So I say, you've got to learn me. <laughs> you know, you know, so, so the, but I was, I was sharing one resident. You know, so at a certain point, I realized I'm grouchy in the morning, actually, because of that. But I don't have to be. What is right is to greet one another, right? Uh, whole, in a holy fashion, right? It's like, like other people do you know, right? in the Hallmark movies, right? So I thought, you know, <laughs> good morning, how are you today? You know, I, I was, we, we never greeted one another in my household growing up that way, and I never greeted another human being that way in my life. So I said, maybe it's time to start. And I woke up to how I feel, but I'll do what's right anyhow, despite how I feel. And I said, I tried it, first person I saw, I said, Good morning, how are you, how are you today? <laughs> and, and I had two different responses. One was, what's so good about it? Oh. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, ooh. <laughs> And then the next one, I tried it, and I said, good morning, how are you today? And they said, what back? Guess what? Good morning. Good morning. I'm good, how about you? And a warm and fuzzy feeling came all over me on the inside. <laughs> wow. It feels good to do the Father's will, not my will. So let me try it with everything else. I don't feel like going to worship today. I don't feel I have to go to this social gathering. I don't feel like it. I'm not a social butterfly by nature. I'm introspective. But I would make myself go. Fred, you feel like going to this? Nope. <laughs> I'm going in here. I'm going in. <laughs> and what would I do when I got there? You know, it's funny, I found out, like most people in a gathering, I don't know, it was a New Year's Eve, my sister had everybody in, and, and, and people just go gravitate to who they already know. So I said, let me go against the grain. <laughs> so I walked over to somebody I didn't know, I said, how you doing? Uh, I'm Fred, what's your name? And, and they said their name. Yeah. And then we began a little this. I'm, I'm, I'm Jenny's brother. Oh, yeah. How do you know my sister? You know, just the net, right? Uh, here, I'm naturally introspective. But I'm greeting people, I'm taking an interest in them, and I am socializing, <laughs> connecting, you know, with the power of God, the Holy Spirit, coursing through my veins to do the Father's will, not what I feel like doing. Rejoice. He repeats it. Rejoice in not what, but who? Rejoice in he, the Lord. Lord. Yeah. Who's the me? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Well, I, I told you before, if, if you're not sure to answer to the question, Jesus. it's usually Jesus. Specifically, what? Come on, the, the cross. You've got to remember. It's easy now. I told you the answer. You know, the test comes. Not sure the answer? It's Jesus. Specifically, the cross. Remember that. All right? That's what the scriptures are all about. And I didn't realize that at first, you know. I, I did, right? 
I wanted to know who the Savior was. I wanted to know how to be saved. I wanted to know all about Jesus. I turned to Matthew 1 and began to read the New Testament. I was right. <laughs> and it was all about Jesus. You know? And then, and then I, I received him as Savior and I got to study in the Word. I got a little, I got a little paralysis by analysis. You know? I got, oh, I'm not get deep into this. You know? Break this down. This means that. This means this. This means that. That means this. And all of a sudden I realized it. After some time, we began to connect that, this, this, and that, that. And they all come together to tell us all about Jesus. That's really who it's all about. Specifically, the cross, how Jesus connects us to the Father. For eternity. That's right. Is there anything more important than that? I mean, isn't that what God's all about then? Isn't that what Jesus was all about? Yes. Isn't that then, of course, what His Word that the Spirit inspired would be all about? He will glorify me, the Lord said. And the Spirit wrote the Word of God, and it, it's all about Jesus. You know, um, he repeats it, you know. Rejoice in the Lord. That is that you know Jesus as your Savior. If you do, if you don't, you need to. And then you'll, like, just just like Linus shares the gospel with Charlie Brown. See me? Chuck. <laughs> and now he's got joy. You know, it, it ends with him. Uh, he's got a grin ear to ear. Singing uh, Charles Wesley's Heart and Herald Angels and God and Sinners Reconciled. Yes. <laughs> now, Tug McGraw, father of recording artist Tim McGraw, <laughs> he's almost known as much by that. But he was the Philly star reliever who closed out the Philly's first World Series whenever in 1980 by striking out the Royals of Willie Wilson. Long after his fastball lost its velocity, velocity as they call it today now, the uh, hey, uh, low velo. <laughs> <laughs> it means uh, he was down to using his screwball, which he called Scroogey, and the no longer fastball, but slowball, which he called the Peggy Lee. The long gone <laughs> recording artist whose big hit was, Is That All There Is? <laughs> you know, when asked about the, how he dealt with the, the, the pressure you know, of being on the mound with the World Series on the line, he said, I, I went to my frozen snowball theory. And, and, and uh, what's that to me to ask? So he says, well, astrophysicists tell us that in so many million years, the sun will burn out right. and the earth will just freeze over and become a giant snowball. And at that point, nobody will care whether I uh, was successful or not getting the batter out. And it calms me down and I throw the pitch. And he threw the fastball with nothing on it and Willie Wilson was so nervous himself, he didn't have the frozen snowball theory, theory and he just swung at the air and missed. You know, it's funny, uh, he had the right idea, but of course, uh, our perseverance in suffering difficult circumstances will be rewarded by the Lord in eternity. Though the earth won't last forever, our relationship with the Lord will, long after the earth is destroyed, not by uh, snow or ice by fire, and our reward from the Lord will last for all eternity. Our relationship with the Lord will last for all eternity. When we have alumni, that is, residents who have graduated our recovery program at City TN, they come for alumni meetings and events, graduations, and, and I introduce them to a current resident. I say, what you got for him? And the current resident is like, you graduated? You know, this is like they're meeting a celebrity. Yes. And they always say the same thing. So I remember what you came here for. <laughs> it's amazing. I say the same thing. Why? Because they had to learn that for them to persevere and graduate through dealing with, living with 15 other men in early recovery filled with character, character defects. Uh, meaning knuckleheadedness. <laughs> so you... Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, some with willingness to learn and change, and some willing coming to faith in their first or second month there, and, and others willy only just to do enough to, to still have a, 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 a cot and, and, and three hots, you know. Right. And, and so uh, the character defects of the others as well as themselves sidetrack them from what they came there for to get so to get recovered. You know, Philippians 4th chapter, 5th verse, the Lord is near. 
do not be anxious about anything. In the tenth verse, I rejoiced greatly uh, in not but but who in the Lord. Jesus, right? Very good. <laughs> the Lord is Jesus. That uh, at last you renewed your concern for me. Paul's in prison. They say, we got to find out how he's doing. Is he still there? What's he need? Let's get some money together and send it to him. You know, what's he going to do with the money in prison? Right? But, and he doesn't, he doesn't smoke. You know, <laughs> you know so, uh, but they're concerned. And it is not about the offering or the money, Paul writes, but it's that you will have the Lord's reward because you're caring about me. And why is that important even, really? Is it all about me? <laughs> we all need to recover from it's all about me, right? No, because Paul is taking the gospel through the known world at that time. And he's got temporarily waylaid, you know, in uh, prison. From which he's released. <laughs> and the work goes on. <laughs> you know, and, and he's sharing the gospel at that moment on the inside, as uh, they say, of a Roman prison. Just as, through their faith, uh, those believers bring uh, their offerings as to the Lord, to Paul, and their contribution to the world evangelization. Remember the first chapter... Paul calls the Philippian believers my crown. He will be rewarded for the work done by his power, uh, the, the Lord's power through the Spirit, of sharing the gospel with them. And while he was in prison at first, when he got to Philippi, and their faith as a result, then, their crown. Uh, they represent the crown the Lord will give. To Paul. And of course, the believers, Revelation chapters 4 and 5, what do the believers do with their rewards? Sure. They cast their crowns before the Lord. We give them back. What do we do with our salvation? Akapao. The Lord your God and your neighbor. As you said, we give it back to Him. How do we do it? We love our neighbor, we practice it toward our neighbor. As well as making ourselves do what's best for us. It's what's in the best interest of the other. That's what agapali means, in case you're wondering. In sum, our relationship with God and with believers are cause for rejoicing despite our circumstances. You know, my mother like, lays dying just up the street in a condo on the other side of 320 Chester Road. She's still resistant to the gospel. It's just a matter of weeks to live. It grieves me. You know, at, at the same time, uh, Ruth's mom, who lives with us, is declining. She's 94. And Ruth's responsibilities in caregiving go up and higher and more. The demands go further. And my support of her is a little bit I do. You know, I, I, I grieve my mother's demise. I cried as I drove over to visit her Thanksgiving Day. Um, but, you know, by the, by the time I left, and then visited, socialized with relatives. <laughs> Made myself do what I didn't feel like. Right. I, I came home filled with joy. Good. To do the Lord's will. And to do the will of the Father. It brings me joy. It brings me satisfaction that I can know the Lord. And that He would make me useful in relating or me, naturally introspective, connecting with others. As His representative. Ambassador, 2 Corinthians 5, right? Yeah. You know, it's not me. It's the Lord makes me useful. And that's what I'm created for and redeemed for and serve you. And to do the Father's will is a great gift. It has its own reward. Joy. And this is, this is what the lights are about. This is what the cookies, the Christmas cookies are about, the gift giving, yeah. Romans 6.23, right, the visiting, the hosting, the work, to not be distracted by the many preparations that had to be made as Martha was, 
and lose focus of the main point. There was a meeting in her house and she wasn't in it. And who was in the other room? <laughs> Over the other side of the house. Number one, who's the answer? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, very good. <laughs> and he was about to go to the cross. <laughs> very good. Well, this Christmas season, uh, you can have the joy of knowing the Lord as your Savior and uh, doing His will. Regardless of the circumstances and, and resisting the distractions by focusing on the purpose of all of the traditions. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your will. It is better than ours. <laughs> it's for which you created and redeemed us, and it brings us joy to know you and to serve you in our relationship. To do the will of the Father by your power, for your glory, our reward which we give back to you. And help us. Help us to know that we have received your Son as Savior, that we have placed our faith and trust in his death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins, for all eternity, to belong to you, not by our own acts or works or efforts. And we will give thanks and be filled with thanks and praise as all dear servants. Through your Son and His sacrifice, with thanksgiving we pray. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Amen.